Uh, may we ask everyone to settle down now so that we can begin the program. May we ask everyone to please rise for the Philippine National Anthem to be led by the UP Law Shari Valley. Please take your seats. To give us the welcome remarks for this afternoon, I'd like to call on our Dean, Dean Danilo L. Concepcion. Senator Edgardo Angara, Justice uh, Lourdes Sereno, Chancellor um, Cesar Saloma, President Emerlinda Roman, Dean uh, Bakungan, Dean Merlin Magaliona, and Dean Raul Pangalangan, uh, Justice Raul Victorino, Justice uh, Yoli Emiliana. Uh, kung may nalimutan po ako, pasensya na. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Teresita Cruz Sison, si Deputy Ombudsman Francis Ardilesa, uh, President of the UPLO Alumni Association, uh, Boy Reno, is here. Uh, our uh, Secretary of the College, uh, Chit Ardilesa, okay, she's there. Faculty members, students, alumni, guests, a pleasant uh, afternoon to all of you. The UP College of Law, since its establishment in 1911, has lived up to its tradition of excellence and commitment of producing great leaders for our country. Our history is a witness to this college's unparalleled contribution, not only to the legal profession, but also to the Philippine social and political landscape. As we continue to celebrate our 100 years of excellence, let us not be content to just reliving our glorious past, but let us aim to press forward with a renewed dedication to first-class legal education and outstanding public service. With this endeavor in mind, it is high time that we re-examine the role of this institution 
in the light of events and issues brought about by our rapid, rapidly changing society. Thus, it is a great honor for me to welcome all of you to the UP College of Law 12th Centennial Lecture entitled Examining the Role of UP Law. To speak uh, to us this afternoon is no less than the Chairman of the UP Law Centennial Commission, Senator Edgardo J. Angara. Senator Angara is an educator, a lawyer, a banker, and the longest serving senator in the post-EDSA Senate. This afternoon, I hope that by re-examining the role of UP law, this institution will remain relevant to our Filipino people for the next 100 years of its existence. Maraming salamat po at welcome sa UP College of Law. To introduce our speaker this afternoon, I'd like to call on our former Dean, Dr. Raul C. Pangalangan. Good afternoon. Before I go into the formal introduction, allow me to recount to you my very first encounter with uh, Ed Angara. I was then a uh, law student, we're talking about 30 years ago. Um, I was president of the law student government, and there was a big protest in campus. And I drafted a very strong protest. I signed it, and I addressed it to the UP president. Before I knew it, one quiet afternoon, I got a note from the office of the college secretary. Please see the UP president. He wants to talk to you. I broke into cold sweat. I thought I was in real deep trouble. Baka masabun na ako ng UP president. But I was resigned to my fate. I, um, I went to, the, uh, to Quezon Hall on the, at the appointed hour, ready uh, to, uh, you know, to receive a thrashing from the UP president. And to my surprise, Ed Angara then was there seated in his office, and he explained the issue to me very quietly, in a very sober and, in very sober and measured um, tones, and I was surprised. I was a mere law student, and here he was, the UP president, explaining it to me as if I mattered. And since then, really, since then, I have held uh, Ed Angara in the highest uh, respect. He graduated from the UP College of Law in 1958, proceeded to the University of Michigan as a, uh, as a do it scholar for his uh, LLM. His first venture into public service was for the 1971 Constitutional Convention, one of the youngest delegates, actually, uh, to, the, um, to the CONCON. It was after the CONCON and after the Declaration of Martial Law that he organized uh, the ACRA Law Office, and it has grown and flourished um, since then. By 1979, he became IBP president. He served in that position until 81, and it was after his term as IBP president that he became president of the University of the Philippines. He was the UP president at the time of the EDSA uprising, EDSA one. And when we held our first free elections under the 1987 constitution, uh, Ed Angara ran with a senatorial slate upon the invitation of uh, Corazon Aquino. That was uh, his first uh, uh, well, national office after, the, um, after the, his uh, uh, experience at the Constitutional um, Convention. Let me go back to, to my meeting with him in his office when I was a student. You know, what surprised me was that, and I don't know, Senator, you, st you still recall this, after we discussed that big issue in campus, before I knew it, he changed the topic. And law students here must, uh, must appreciate this. He started asking me about my professors. He said, sino yung mga madalas mag-absent? Sino yung mga walang tinuturo? Sino yung mga terror? And I was impressed that here was a UP president over there at Quezon Hall presiding over the entire university in all the campuses from uh, Diliman to, um, uh, to the Visayas to, uh, to, to Los Baños. But who can ask 
and who was aware about, who wanted to be aware about the details at ground level. And I can say that the senator has sustained that approach even in his public service. That he has combined what I saw as the, um, well, let me put it this way. When I went to Harvard, I saw that their ideal was that of a student who can combine ideas about social and economic reform and how to marshal the public energy, public resources to carry out those reforms and to do, to, to do that through the architecture of law. And I see that in um, Senator Angara. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for this, uh, for this afternoon, Senator Edgardo J. Angara. Maraming salamat, uh, Raul. You know, up to now, I'm very inquisitive. I'm very curious. I keep asking people, what is this, what is that? Explain to me why you did that and why you did not. I even asked Emer Roman when she was president. So I greet you, Emer, and our Justice uh, Sereno, a very able, dynamic uh, lawyer, our Chancellor Saloma. Where is Cesar? Oh, there. Our Dean, Danny. Uh, the Chief Hardelesa, our Secretary. And let me greet my favorite Dean, Kaklasiko eh, si Merlin Magadona. <laughs> and my fellow law, 58 uh, classmates, si Dean Bakungan. Ito. It, he was Dean when I was when I entered the UP as president, hindi ba, uh, Roylan? Members of the faculty, my fellow members of the commission, our president of the Alumni Association, Attorney Reino, Raul Victorino, fellow students and friends of uh, the UP College of Law. Let me go straight to my topic. And my topic is uh, looking back at 100 years of UP law and what UP law could become in the next 100 years. I don't think we'll all be there at the end of it, but at least we can, we can uh, speculate. As you know, as Francis Ardelesa, my, our deputy Mutsman, very important person because he might just charge us and Joe Abejo, the president of our law class 58. The, our university was founded in, 20, in 1908. But our, so our centenary of the university was what, uh, about uh, five years ago, three years ago. And we are celebrating the centenary of the College of Law, three years after the university's centenary. Bakit ganon? Because even then, people suspect lawyers and are suspicious of law schools. So on, when the first dean, Dean Malcolm, proposed to the Board of Regents the establishment of a law school, they didn't, they're skeptical they doubt our capacity to, to practice law. And so, our establishment was delayed for three years, but in the meantime, vet med anduna, agi, agriculture anduna, uh, and many other colleges were established well ahead of law. And uh, to us, knowing the record our alumni have established in public service, in, in other fields of human endeavor, we should say that was a great mistake, to the great delight of 
those guys in uh, in Loyola Heights, in other law schools. You know? But never mind. We came in. We proved that we can hack it. So on on January 11, 2011, the board passed a resolution establishing the law school. But it's not until six years, uh, six months later, on July 11, that the law school formally opened the, its doors to enrollment. That's why I was wondering, Danny, why are we celebrating January 11? Because it was the date the board approved it. Why not July 11, so that we gain, Rapi, we gain another six months to fundraise. <laughs> <laughs> But, but letting that uh, aside, so that's the reason why we celebrate our centenary three years after the universities. And as, you, as uh, typical, we came, we were born, like what lawyers sometimes do, by poaching. We poach the students from YMCA, where the first law school was was taught. Indeed, the next 100 years since 1911, the quickness and sharpness, or rather as we lawyers like to call it, acuity and celerity of UP lawyers would become legendary. The first graduating class produced Manuel Rojas, the first president of the Republic, Ricardo Paras, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Senator Alejandro de Guzman. But sometimes I wonder where he came from and who, who are his descendants. And they told me he's from Nuevicia. Emilio Hilado and Quirino Abad Santos, who became great judges, Feliciano Ocampo the first public service commissioner, really great uh, pioneers. This tradition of <clears throat> public service continued to this day or continues to this day in all branches of government. As nowhere else, we will see this constant, constant shifting among the alumni from private to public life, from public life to uh, private life as though the UP lawyer feels very strongly and very passionately that he owes society a debt of gratitude. I think that's what we all feel about our education because it's, it's, it's uh, paid for partly, no man, because we have to give no man credit to our parents, partly, even to a large extent, by, public, by the public purse. The, the college also produced notable leaders outside the legal profession. In the police, huh? those days belonging to the police is a great distinction. <laughs> Education, the arts, and a wide variety of businesses, and even religion. The college, the college would have produced five presidents if Fidel Castro, who belonged to our class, 58, then shift to West Point. He would have been the, fifth, the five UP alumnus to become UP president, which was, I think, good for the UP. <laughs> good for the country, maybe. Thus, Conrado Benitez, class 16, co-founded the Philippine Women's University in 1919 the first women's university, the first university for women in Asia. Three decades later, Manuel Chan, class 31, and Car Carmelino Alvendia, class 30, established the Manuel Quezon University, even now noted for the teaching of law. And of, of recent uh, decades, Loida Nicholas Lewis founded the Lewis College in Sorsogon in honor of a very, very famous uh, American entrepreneur, her husband. 
Other graduates, too many to mention, went on to lead other learning institutions in the capital here in Metro Manila, as well as in the provinces. In the arts, the college produced distinguished alumnus or alumni, Jose Arruego, a noted writer and illustrator of children's books, Belinda T. Casper, a noted uh, novelist and literary critic. Other published novelists include Esteban Javeliana, Without Seeing the Dawn, Sancho Almeda, The Filipino Dream, and of recent vintage, Giselle, Gisela Gonzalez Montinola, where the children are. Fidel Sikam was a prominent and noted playwright. He's also an alumnus. This great secular institution produced notable men and women of the faith as well. Father Constantino Nieva, Father Art Ferrer, Sister Mary Tarsila, Sister Sonia Aldeguer, and Sister Leticia Aliado. Other alumni in business, there are so numerous of them, there are so many, defy exhaustive uh, uh, enumeration. Too many to, to start even mentioning. They become builders of business enterprises in real estate, insurance, energy, mining, communications, and transportation, to name just a few modern fields of uh, commerce and, and business. But just to cite one, Francisco Ortigas of the Ortigas. Uh, uh, in media, Eugenio Lopez Sr., the founder of ABS-CBN, is class 23. And of recent uh, generation, Felipe Goson and her daughter, Ana Teresa Goson Abrogar, of GMA-7. Maybe, Cesar, you, uh, we may spin off the CUP. It may become a great uh, communications empire as well. Yeah. The, the college also served as a great platform for supplying military leaders at the outbreak of the war. The Class 41 really provided many, many of our alumni law alumni who served in Bataan, in Corridor, and in the underground. And later on, when war ended and peace returned, they joined the, the police, mainly the, the constabulary. And in the longest running insurgency we have, we also sub supplied some of their leaders. You know? June Abbas, you will recall, was the Secretary General of the Bank Samoro National Liberation Front. <clears throat> but history is not enough. The future belongs, or rather, the future beckons to the next generation of UP lawyers. I mean, we just hope that this generation of UP lawyers will be as distinguished, as diligent, as nationalistic and patriotic as the generations before them. Not only doing well for themselves, but doing well for this college, by this college, by this university and country. But to me, the future of this school depends largely on its ability to adjust to a very changed and completely radical atmosphere and environment we are operating now. In adjusting its teaching methods to the times and the mounting challenges facing the practice of the profession. The threat or promise of specialization uh, compared to a generalist has pushed the generalists to the side. Globalization has aggravated this trend to the extent that the Financial Times recently 
noted that in today's world, a super lawyer, someone who knows everything about anything, is probably irrelevant now. Is viewed with skepticism and disregarded in favor of the specialist. Those who know more about a narrower field indeed offer a tremendous advantage to business in legal conflicts. And if a business in legal trouble wants to cover its flanks, it should hire a specialist in other fields because that's what happens in war and business, I submit to you, is war. The worst challenge to the legal profession to me, the worst challenge it faced to its survival was the economic crisis of 28. Because next to the advertising budget, businesses dropped the legal budget. They dropped retainers and all. That really wrecked havoc to the profession of law, to the practice of law. But frankly, it has always been like that. When lawyers win a case, the client thinks he was always right in the first place. When lawyers lose a case, it is the lawyer's fault for losing a winning case. It is worse when good legal work keeps trouble, legal trouble, away from the client. Then the client wonders, why should I pay a lawyer huh? for, for, for no problem at all. There's no problem because that lawyer in the first place kept the problems away from the client, but he doesn't realize that. And then since law can be read, and as you know in the UK, law is read rather than, than taught. And though not mastered, by anyone literate, management gurus and consultants now mind the brains of their legal staff, of the insights that they have learned in law school, they've read uh, in law schools. And since law by, nat by its nature is and should be routine and repetitive. Hence the preeminence of, of precedent. That's what we go by in law, precedent. It is vulnerable to computerization. And law has now become like DVDs that you can buy off the shelf. You know, legal forms you can buy off the shelf. Right? Lo, uh, legal forms for the dummies. They were sabi, dummy yan sa kwan eh, sa Barnes and Noble eh, di ba? Because they have literally computerized wills, contracts of sale, uh, attorneys, uh, um, uh, agencies, halos lahat computerized yan. So what's the use of lawyers when you can buy off forms, when you can buy forms off the shelf? like uh, DVDs, perhaps even pirated. You know? There is no way to fight this trend, I, be, I submit. The way to, to go with this trend and go and not fight is to join the, join the fight. We have the mental strength, lawyers have the mental strength to master the law. And we can bring that mastery and strength of the, of the mind to, to other fields. Harvard Law, for instance, emphasizes its ability to offer joint degree programs. They offer joint degree programs, law with economics, law with business administration. So in the, that's, teaching a lawyer multiple skills so that he can multitask in the end and then specialize uh, in the end. So is Yale Law School. They've gone the truth. But beyond just uh, 
just uh, doing joint programs within the university, Harvard, Yale, and the all great law schools of the world have tied up with foreign universities, foreign law schools. And therefore, this is the age of the global law schools. Going abroad for your master's or your PhD in law is not a, not a not exactly something that is given to you. No, that should be part and parcel of your study of law. It should become part of mainstream curriculum of every law school. And I want UP to lead in this regard. For instance, Harvard has exchanged program with the Geneva Faculty of Law with Fudan, the premier law school in, in, in China, in Shanghai, with Tokyo University, almost all leading law schools of the world. And this has become a global, a global practice. But Philippine teaching and practice seem to be impervious to all these global trends. Our profession, I believe, discourages foreign entanglements. Foreign legal scholars may not teach credited courses in Philippine law schools, let alone practice before our courts. You can go if you want to take your master's abroad, but it will have negligible, if any, effect on your practice back home. You can take the bar in New York, but the foreigner cannot take the bar here in the Philippines, much less practice in the Philippines. These are the challenges facing the future teaching and practice of law. We Filipinos ought not to be afraid of foreign competition from foreigners. We ought to be able to stand on our own and pit our brains against anyone in the world. We have done that in many professions, in medicine, in engineering, in arts. Why not in the legal profession? And there was, as I said, I suggest that the UP this time take the lead, not simply follow. We take the lead. In fact, we are not even following at this point, I, I, I believe. Address, addressing the critical climate of the rule of law today, and I think, crit, uh, well, not critics, but, but uh, watchers and students of the Philippine scene today see the rule of law in this country under test, under serious test. It is true that great views are being expressed across the board from all the law schools with at least equal excellence, penetration, and wisdom as any expressed from this, uh, from this hall. But let us not judge law schools by the eloquence of an occasional practitioner in a moment of constitutional crisis. No law school can claim, for instance, the erudite Pepe Jokno. Pepe Jokno didn't come from any law school. He, he read, studied law during the war, took the bar, tapped it, and became one of our top constitutionalists. Law schools are not established to create great men for great moments, but to make excellent everyday lawyers to protect good men in the ordinary course of the law. Those who from that everyday but necessary vocation rise to greatness will owe their eminence not from the school they attended, but from the conscience, values, and wisdom they acquire on their own. And I think that is the teaching of this law school. So on that note, let me end and thank you, my, my colleagues, for this great opportunity to give this short talk. And uh, as we wind up our cent centenary celebration, I'm pleased to let you know, in behalf of the UP Centennial Commission, 
that we have raised quite a substantial sum for the UP College of Law. And I think maybe no other college have um, raised at least one billion for its college, and that's what we have raised. <laughs> but it's easy for to, to some and to many of our alumni to give to the UP. But I think the greater challenge lies in the hands of the faculty and the leadership of this uh, school that we must now change as times have radically changed. We must change our teaching methods. I may still st ask who are the, those who are always absent, who are terror, and I will continue to do so up to today. Thank you very much and again. Okay, again, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to open the floor for any questions, and I've asked Senator Angara to stay in the rostrum. So if we have any questions, uh, to the good Senator, we have three microphones on each of the aisle and in the center aisle. Well, I have one question. Gisele, they're, they're happy with my talk. <laughs> I think, sir, they are happy. <laughs> <laughs> so if we have no uh, questions, can we give uh, the good senator again a round of applause for the uh, <laughs> lecture this afternoon? And uh, we'd like to invite everybody to snacks after outside. We will be uh, serving uh, snacks for everybody. And we'd like for all of you to please rise for the UP Law Centennial March. <laughs>